Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House would like to join me in wishing people in the UK and across the world a happy St David's Day. I'm, I'm sure the whole House... I'm sure the whole House will also want to join me in paying tribute to our former colleague, Sir Gerald Kaufman, who died over the weekend. He was an outstanding parliamentarian. He was a committed MP who dedicated his life to the service of his constituents. And as father of the House, his wisdom and experience will be very much missed right across this House. And I'm sure our thoughts are with his friends and family. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'd like to associate myself with the Prime Minister's remarks and assure the many relatives and friends of our former colleague that they are very much in our thoughts and in our prayers at this difficult time. Mr Speaker, following last week's historic by-election victory in Copeland... Does my right honourable friend believe this is an endorsement of her government's plans to maintain a strong economy, to bring our society together and ensure that we make a huge success of leaving the European Union? Can I uh, thank my honourable friend? And first of all, I would like to congratulate my honourable friend, the new member for Copeland, and I look forward to welcoming her to this House very shortly. But my honourable friend is absolutely right that last week's historic result in Copeland was an endorsement of our plans to keep the economy strong and our plans to ensure that places like Copeland do share in the economic success after years of labour neglect. It was also an endorsement of our plans to unite communities where labour seek to sow division. And I think it was an endorsement of offering strong, competent leadership in the face of Labour's chaos. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I join the Prime Minister in wishing everyone in Wales and all Welsh people all around the world a very happy St David's Day? And could I also express the hope that the workers at the Ford plant in Bridge End get today the assurances they need about their job security and their futures? Mr Speaker, I also want to echo the Prime Minister's tribute to Gerald Kaufman, who served in this House since 1970, the longest-serving member, started in political life as an adviser to Harold Wilson in the 1960s. He was an iconic, irascible figure in the Labour Party and in British politics. He was a champion for peace and justice in the Middle East and around the world. Yesterday, Mr Speaker, at his funeral, the rabbi who conducted the service conveyed your message on behalf of the House to his family, which was very much appreciated. Afterwards, I was talking to members of his family and his uh, great-nephews and great-nieces, and I asked, how would you describe Gerald? And they said he was an awesome uncle. And I think we should remember Gerald as that. And... uh, convey our condolences to all of his family. Mr Speaker, just after the last budget, the then Work and Pension Secretary resigned, accusing the government of balancing the books on the backs of the poor and vulnerable. Last week, the government sneaked out a decision to overrule a court decision to extend personal independence payments to people with severe mental health conditions. A government that found a billion pounds in inheritance tax cuts to benefit 26,000 families seems unable to find the money to support 160,000 people with debilitating mental health conditions. Will the Prime Minister change her mind? Let me be very clear about what is being proposed in relation to personal independence payments. This is not a policy change. This is not... This is not a cut in the amount that is going to be spent on disability benefits, and no one is going to see a reduction in their benefits from that previously awarded by the DWP. What we are doing, what we are doing is restoring this, this uh, particular payment to the original intention that was agreed by the coalition government, agreed by this parliament after extensive consultation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. 
Well, extensive consultation is an interesting idea because the court made its decision last year. The government did not consult the Social Security Advisory Committee and instead, at the last minute, sneaked out its decision. The court ruled that the payments should be made because the people who were going to benefit from it were suffering overwhelming psychological distress. Just a year ago, the new work and pension secretary said he can tell the House we're not going ahead with the changes to PIP that were put forward. The court have since made a ruling. Her friend, the member for South Cambridge, has said, in my view, the courts are there for a reason. If they've come up with this ruling which says the criteria should be extended, I believe we have a duty to honour that. Isn't she right? First of all... First of all, on the issue of uh, these payments and those with mental health conditions, actually the personal independence payment is better for people with mental health conditions. If you look at the figures, two-thirds of people with mental health conditions who are uh, uh, in receipt of, who are claiming personal independence payments and in receipt of that, two-thirds of them actually get awarded the higher daily living rate allowance. That compares that two-thirds compares to less than a quarter under the previous DLA arrangements. But it's the second time that the Right Honourable Gentleman has suggested that somehow this change was sneaked out. It was in a written ministerial statement to Parliament. I might remind him, week after week he talks to me about the importance of Parliament. Well, we accepted the importance of Parliament and made the statement to Parliament. But also, he referred to the Social Security Advisory Committee, and they can look at this. My right honourable friend, the Work and Pensions Secretary, called the Chairman of the Social Security Advisory Committee and spoke to him about the regulations on the day they were being introduced. He called, he called the Chairman of the Work and Pensions Select Committee and spoke to him about the regulations that were being introduced. He called both offices of the Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary, but there was no answer and they didn't come back to him for four days. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, calling the Mr Speaker, calling the Mr Speaker, calling the chairs of two committees and making a written statement to the House does not add up to scrutiny. And as I understand it, there was no call made to the office of my friend, the Shadow Secretary of State. Mr Speaker, the reality is this is a shameful decision that will affect people with dementia, those suffering cognitive disorders due to a stroke, military veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder and those with schizophrenia. Can she look at the effects of her decision to override what an independent court has decided and think again? The the issues that he raises, the conditions that he raises, these are taken into account when decisions are made about the personal independence payments. What the court said was that the regulations were unclear. That is why we are clarifying the regulations and we are ensuring that they respect, that they reflect the original intention that was agreed by this Parliament. But I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, if he wants to talk about support that is being given to people on disability, with disabilities, this Government is spending more than ever in support for people with disability and health conditions. We are spending more than ever on people with mental health conditions. And as I say to him, what we're doing with the personal independence payments is ensuring that those who are most in need get most support. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, the government has overridden an independent court decision on this, and they should think very long and hard about that. Her friend, the member for North East Bedfordshire, said this week the government had to make it very clear that physical and mental health had the same priority. In 2002, the Prime Minister made a speech to the Conservative Party conference. I remember it very well. I was watching it on television. She said um, she described her party as the nasty party. And she said some Tories have tried to make political capital by demonising minorities. 
This week, her policy chair suggested people with debilitating conditions were those who, and I quote, who take pills at home, who suffer from an anxiety, and were not really disabled. Isn't that proof the nasty party's still around? My honourable friend has rightly apologised for the comments that he made, and I hope that this whole House will accept his apology. He asks, the right honourable gentleman asks me about the parity between mental health and physical, uh, mental health conditions and physical conditions. It is this Conservative government that has introduced parity of esteem in relation to dealing with mental health and, and in the National Health Service. How many years were Labour in government and did nothing about that? Thirteen years. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, it was a Labour amendment to the Health and Social Care Bill that resulted in parity of esteem being put on the face of the bill. I'm surprised she's forgotten that because she could take this opportunity to thank the Labour Party for putting that forward. This, earlier this... Uh, the Prime Minister made a speech earlier this year supporting parity of esteem for mental health, and I'm glad she did. 40% of NHS mental health trusts, however, are having their budgets cut. There are 6,600 fewer mental health nurses and 160,000 people with severe mental health conditions about to lose out on support. Can she not recognise parity of esteem means funding it properly and not overriding court decisions that would benefit people suffering from very difficult conditions? We should reach out to them, not deny them the support they need. As I say, we are spending more than ever on mental health. That's £11.4 billion a year. More people each week are now receiving treatment in relation to mental health uh, than have done previously. Uh, Is there more for us to do on mental health? Yes, there is. I've said that in this chamber in answer to questions that I've received uh, previously. Ah, well, do it, shouts the uh, Shadow uh, Foreign Secretary from her normal sedentary position, uh, commenting that... uh, Oh, sorry, We are doing it. That's why we're putting record amounts of money into mental health. That's why we're seeing more people actually being provided with mental health treatment every week under this government. But there is one thing that I know. If you are going to be able to provide that extra support for people with disabilities and health conditions, if you're going to be able to provide uh, treatment for people with mental health conditions, you need to have the strong economy that enables us to pay for it. And the one thing thing we know about Labour is that they would bankrupt Britain. Coming from a government that by 2020 will have borrowed more and increased the national debt by the total borrowing of all Labour governments, that comes rich. Mr Speaker, the mental health charity Rethink said the government has spoken forcefully about the importance of parity of esteem between physical and mental health, yet when presented with the chance to make this a reality has passed the opportunity by. Mr Speaker, as a society, we are judged by how we treat the most vulnerable. The respected mental health charity Mind has said this misguided legislation must be reversed. Can't the Prime Minister look again, look again at the decision of the court, look again at the consequences of it, and withdraw this deep decision, this nasty decision, accept the court's judgment and support those going through a very difficult time in their lives. That is how we will all be judged. The way that we are dealing with disability benefits is to ensure that payments are going to those who are most vulnerable. What we are doing in relation to the personal independence payments is ensuring that the agreement of this Parliament is being put into practice. But he talks about funding and he talks about borrowing. I understand that today have a constant debate while the Prime Minister is answering the question. The question has been put and was heard, and the answer must be heard without a constant hubbub in the background. The Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah. He, talks, he talks about restoring, uh, about actually accepting the Court's decision and paying for that. Well, I understand that the Labour Shadow Health Secretary today, uh, when asked how Labour would pay for the increase if it was put in place, said, uh, 
We've not outlined that yet. <laughs> that, just, that just sums up the Labour Party and the Labour Party leadership. You know, uh, after the result in Copeland last week, after the result in Copeland last week, the Honourable Member for Lancaster and Fleetwood summed up, summed up the by-election result by saying it was an incredible result for the Labour Party. <laughs> you know, I think that word actually describes the right honourable gentleman's leadership. Incredible. <laughs> Stephen Metcalf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on Monday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Monday, I chaired a seminar at the Royal Society looking at the priorities for the science community as we start our Brexit negotiations. A report of the meeting will be launched here in Parliament on the 21st of March. Well, of course, I understand that the Prime Minister may be too busy to attend that uh, herself. Will she agree with, to meet with me once the report is published so that I can present the collective concerns of the science community to her in person, particularly around collaboration and people? Oh, I thank my honourable friend for raising this. It is an important issue. He's right to raise it. We do want to be uh, the UK to be the go-to place for innovators and investors across the world. We want to secure the best possible outcomes for the UK research base as we leave the European Union. Indeed, it's one of the objectives that I've set out in our negotiations for the European Union relates to science and research. We're already a leading destination for science and innovation, uh, and we welcome agreement to continue to collaborate with our European partners. I'm interested in what uh, my honourable friend has said, and I'm sure that that report will be looked at very carefully by my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, for exiting the European Union. And does Robertson... We, we on these benches join the Prime Minister and the Labour, leader of the Labour Party in extending our condolences to the family and friends of Sir Gerald uh, Kaufman and also extending our best wishes to the people of Wales on St David's Day. Just prior to PMQs today, in Scottish questions, ministers were unable to answer basic questions about government plans for agriculture and for fisheries. These are important industries for the rural economy and they are devolved areas to the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. With Brexit ending the role of Brussels in these areas, will all decisions about agriculture and fisheries be made at Holyrood, yes or no? Well, the Right Honourable Gentleman knows very well that we are discussing with the devolved administrations the whole question of the UK framework and uh, and, uh, devolution of issues as they come back from Brussels. The overriding aim, I think, for everything that we do when we make those decisions is making sure that we don't damage the very important single market of the United Kingdom. Uh, A market which I might remind the Right Honourable Gentleman is more important to Scotland than the European Union is. Angus Robertson. That's a very interesting answer, Mr Speaker, because during during the Brexit referendum, people in Scotland including those working in the agriculture and fisheries sector, were told that farming and fisheries powers would be exercised fully by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. But now, now it seems, judging by the Prime Minister's answer, that that is not going to be true. Will the Prime Minister confirm today, she has the opportunity, will she confirm today that it is her intention to ensure that it is UK ministers that will negotiate and regulate over large areas that impact on Scottish fisheries and agriculture post-Brexit. I I repeat to the right honourable gentleman, but he seems not to have quite understood this point, that we are in the process of discussing with the devolved administrations the whole question of which of those powers that currently reside in Brussels will be returned and remain at a UK level for decision and which would be further devolved into the devolved administrations. That is a discussion that is taking place at the moment. But when he asks about the negotiations for Brexit with the European Union, it will be the UK government that will be negotiating with the European Union, taking full account of the interests and concerns of the devolved area of the devolved administrations and indeed of all the other regions of England. Nigel Adams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Does the Prime Minister agree that when tickets to a teenage cancer charity gig by Ed Sheeran are being resold on the Viagogo ticket website for over £1,000, with none of that money going to the charity, and tickets to the hit musical Hamilton are touted for upwards of £5,000, 
when Viagogo know only too well that tickets that are resold are invalid for entry, it's unfair and not indicative of a market that works for everyone. What will the government do to ensure genuine fans are not fleeced by ticket touts and rogues? Uh, Well, I thank my honourable friend for raising this important issue. I know it's one that he has been working on uh, for some time, and he's absolutely right to identify those circumstances, as he does, where there are websites that are causing, uh, uh, that are acting in the way that he talks about and causing the problems he talks about for people who genuinely believe that they're able to buy tickets for for, for what they wish to uh, what they wish to attend. I understand he's recently met my right honourable friend, the Minister for of State for Digital and Cultural Matters, to discuss this issue and. As he will be aware, the Consumer Rights Act introduced new rules on ticketing and a review of online ticket sales, and DCMS are going to shortly respond to the independent report by Professor Michael Waterson on this issue. But we are, as a government, looking at the general issue of where markets are not working in the interests of consumers. Mr Steve Reid, Speaker, can can I um, add add my, my condolences to those already expressed about the former father of the House, and also welcome to his place the new member for Stoke on Trent. Mr. Mr. Speaker, young black men using mental health services young black men using mental health services are more likely to be subject to detention, extreme forms of medication and severe physical restraint than other people and in extreme cases this has led to death, including that of my constituent Shaney Lewis. Too many black people with mental ill health are afraid to seek treatment from a service they fear will not treat them fairly. Will the Prime Minister meet with me and some of the affected families to discuss the need for an inquiry into institutional racism in their mental health services? Uh, I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman and I am happy to welcome the new member for uh, Stoke-on-Trent Centre uh, to, uh, to this House. Uh, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, it is precisely because of a concern about how uh, various people uh, were being treated within our public services that this government has introduced, I introduced last year, an audit of the disparity of treatment, of a racial audit of disparity of treatment within public services. I saw this as Home Secretary when I looked at the way that particularly people with black, mental, black people with mental health issues were being dealt with in terms of police and, uh, and uh, 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 detention in various ways. And that's exactly the sort of issue that we are looking at. I'm very happy for him to write to me with the details of the, of the particular issue that he's set out. Churchill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Prime Minister join me in congratulating my West Suffolk College, um, all the staff, and in particular the principal, uh, Nikos Savas, who last week in the Times Educational Further Education Awards won the prestigious Teaching and Learning Initiative for the whole country. By combining... Maths, arts, religion, and science. This, I'm sure she will agree with me that this initiative drives forward inquisitive minds and grows future generations that we will need for the skills that they need to succeed. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating West Suffolk uh, College for the award that they have been uh, given in this category for best teaching and learning initiative for their Mars initiative. I think it's a really interesting initiative that they have uh, put in place. I congratulate all the uh, staff, and this is a sign, I think, this award of the dedication of the staff and the students at West Suffolk uh, College. Uh, All colleges across the country should be aspiring to reach these standards, and she's absolutely right. We do need to ensure that young people have not just a skill set, but also the inquiring mind that enables them as they look forward to what may be different careers throughout their life to be able to embrace new skills and change throughout their careers. This is Mary Glyndon. My constituent, Joanne Good's 16-year-old daughter, Megan, tragically died after drinking half a three-litre bottle of Frosty Jack cider, which is 7.5% proof and at under £4 a bottle contains 22 vodka shot equivalents. Does the Prime Minister accept that cheap Super strength white cider is a health hazard and should be banned or at the very least carry a much higher duty per unit. First of all, I'm sure that members across the whole House will want to join me in offering our deepest sympathies to the family of this 16-year-old 
uh, constituent, former constituent of uh, the Honourable Lady. And she does raise a very important issue, and that's why uh, we do, as a government, recognise the harm that is associated with, with problem consumption of alcohol. Uh, we've taken action through the duty system, so these high strength cider and beer are taxed more than equivalent lower strength products. We've also, of course, taken action on the very cheap alcohol by banning sales below duty plus VAT. But there's another element too, which is of course making sure that young people are aware of the dangers and the harms of alcohol misuse. And Public Health England and the NHS have run campaigns offering advice and support to young people. And they also work with charities and in schools to help to raise that awareness, which I think is an important part. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're rightly proud that young people, regardless of race, creed or colour, can study at our colleges and universities. Yet this week, Jewish students are being subjected to intimidation, fear and to anti-Semitism as a result of so-called Israel Apartheid Week. What action can my right hon friend make to make sure that chancellors and principals ensure that anti-Semitism is not allowed to prosper on campuses? Well, uh, I will first of all want to assure my honourable friend that higher education institutions have a responsibility to ensure that they provide a safe and inclusive environment for all students. And we expect them to have robust policies and procedures in place to comply with the law, to investigate and swiftly address hate crime, including any anti-Semitic incidents that are reported. Uh, I know that my honourable friend, the Universities Minister, has actually recently written to remind institutions of these expectations, and he's also urged them to follow the government's lead in adopting the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Roger Mullen. Mr Speaker, there is a flaw in the legislative reform order with which the government is seeking to create private fund limited partnerships which allows criminal-owned Scottish Limited Partnerships to easily convert to these new types of partnerships. Will the Prime Minister step in and delay the LRO until such times as the current Bayes review into SLPs is completed? Well, we have taken important steps to tackle money laundering, terrorist financing and other economic crimes. I uh, oversaw the establishment of the Economic Crime Command in the National Crime Agency. On the question that he raises of Scottish Limited Partnerships, um, I understand that the Department for Business consulted last year on further transparency requirements for SLPs, and they will be uh, publishing proposals soon, and that my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, is gathering evidence which may lead to further reform. Andrew Bingham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, My uh, my right honourable friend will be aware of the concerns over the new business rates. And uh, whilst there is a welcome from many of the businesses in the high peak who will be taken out of business rates, there is a concern amongst those who have seen an increase, in one case as much as 85 per cent. Can she uh, give me an assurance and give those business assurance that we will do all we can for these people who work incredibly hard to be the engine room of our economy and a rise of this size may indeed threaten their livelihood itself? Well, Business rates, as my honourable friend knows, are based on property value, and, and as he will also know, it's been seven years since those uh, was, this uh, property values were last looked at. So I think it's absolutely right that we update them. But of course. As I recognised last week, there are different impacts on different businesses, and it is important we have put, uh, already put significant sums into transitional support for uh, businesses so that we help the companies who are facing increased bills. But I, as I said in this House last week, have asked my right honourable friends, the Chancellor and the Community Secretary, to make sure that the support that is provided is appropriate and is in place for the hardest cases. And I would expect my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, to uh, say more about this next week. The budget. Sarah Olney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A recent National Audit Office report exposed massive government overspend on new free school sites, with the department estimating it will need to spend a further £2.5 billion on land for these schools. Schools across my constituency are reporting chronic levels of underfunding. Will the Prime Minister please review the plans for new free schools and provide our existing schools with the investment that they need? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm happy to say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, we have protected the core school's budget uh, in, uh, in real terms. What we, but what we are doing, and yes, we have had free schools, and I understand that she may want to, she raises uh, a concern about that. But what we have seen through the programme that we've had of free schools and academies uh, that has been continued, is continued under this government, is to ensure that we are creating more good school places across this country. That's what we want to do, and that's what our policy will continue to do. Lynn Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, I'd like to join the Prime Minister in wishing Wales a, a, de- a happy deed de- Sant St David's Day. Now, the, the Secretary of State for Wales has been working with colleagues across government, sending out the message to the world that Wales is one of the best places in the United Kingdom to live, to work, to visit and to trade with. Now, does the Prime Minister agree with me that Welsh interests must remain at the heart of our United Kingdom? As we leave the European Union, the future of the UK Union has never been more important. I'd like to thank my honourable friend for that question. He's absolutely right to be raising the importance of Wales. And my right honourable friend, the Welsh Secretary, is doing important work reminding the world that Wales is one of the best places in the UK to live, to work and to trade with. And in the re- forthcoming negotiations, we're committed to getting a deal that works for all parts of the UK, including Wales. And I think the best way to achieve that is for the UK Government and the devolved administrations to continue to work together. I'm pleased to say that I'm going to be hosting a St David's Day reception in Downing Street tonight to celebrate everything that Wales has to offer. And can I once again, can I, can I once again wish all members of this House Deeth Goyle Dewey Happis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Congestion, journey times and connectivity between Bradford and Leeds are among the worst in the country. Will the Prime Minister support our campaign to ensure that Bradford is part of the HS3 network and will she commit to delivering the investments we so desperately need for our West Yorkshire powerhouse? Um, I apologise to the Honourable Lady because I missed the first part of her question. I think she was talking about investment in infrastructure in in the area. HS3, right, thank you. Um, uh, what we, I'm very clear that obviously we've already set out commitments that we have uh, made as a government in relation to infrastructure. As she will know, we do believe that infrastructure plays an important part in uh, encouraging the growth of the economy and in ensuring that we do see uh, that we increase productivity around the rest of the country. And of course, we'll be looking over time at further projects that can do just that. Tory Apprentice. Yeah. in Copeland recently, people wanted to talk about the future of their local maternity unit. It was just like being at home in Banbury. Rather than politicise the NHS, would the Prime Minister agree to a review of maternity services, encouraging not just care that is safe, but also care that is kind and close to home? Well, my my honourable friend does raise an important point in relation to local maternity services. And uh, as I've said, I'm looking forward very shortly to welcoming the new member for Copeland in this House. But during that campaign, she made it very clear that she didn't want to see any downgrading of the the West Cumberland Hospital services. But she also did something else, because she put forward a very powerful case for what my honourable friend has just suggested, which is a review uh, to tackle the recruitment issues that affect these uh, maternity services up there. And that professionally-led review does seem very sensible, and I know the Health Minister is looking at it. Alex Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A 19-year-old constituent of mine faces being discharged by the Tees, Esk and Weir Valley's Mental Health Trust for a second time because they have neither the skills nor the cash to provide the support he needs. What's the Prime Minister's message to him? I'm sorry, obviously I don't know the full details of the individual case that the Honourable Gentleman has raised. I do know that we are ensuring that more money is being put into mental health uh, conditions over the, uh, over the year and uh, will continue to be. Um, but if he wishes to write to me uh, or to the Secretary of State for Health about that case, I'm sure he will be looking into it. Andrew Salou. As a leader who wants to spread wealth and opportunity as widely as possible, Will the Prime Minister ensure that we end the practice of developers buying freehold land on which they go and sell new houses on a leasehold basis? Many first-time buyers on Help to Buy 
feel they are being ripped off by this practice and look to the government for help in this area? Well, uh, I thank my honourable friend for raising this point, and it's an issue that he has raised with me previously. I know he is concerned about it and working on it. Our housing white paper clearly sets out that developers should be building homes for people to live in. That means we will act to promote fairness for the growing number of leaseholders, but we will be consulting on a range of measures to tackle unfair and unreasonable abuses of leasehold, as my hon. Friend, the Housing Minister, has said. And other than in uh, certain cir- exceptional circumstances, I don't see why a new home should not be built and sold with the freehold interest at the point of sale. Kevin Barron. Mr Speaker, could I add my condolences to the family of the uh, 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 of Gerald Calfer, one of uh, uh, my friends in this place. Prime Minister, yesterday I received an email from a local pharmacist who, since the government's announcement in October of last year, has had to implement cost-cutting measures, including staff and services. This week he received the notification of the payment for prescriptions dispensed in December of last year and has had a reduction of nearly £9,000, which represents 18.8% well beyond the 4% the, ministers, the pharmacy minister spoke about in October of last year. Could I ask you, will the government commit to revisit community pharmacy funding as a matter of urgency? Yeah. We all recognise the important service that pharmacies provide, and that's why spending on them has actually risen in recent years. And also, we've seen uh, an increase of over 18% in the past decade in the number of pharmacies. The system does need to reform so that the NHS resources are spent efficiently and effectively. And just to look at some of the figures, two-fifths of pharmacies are within 10 minutes' walk of two or more other pharmacies. The average pharmacy receives roughly £220,000 a year in NHS funding, and most pharmacies receive the £25,000 establishment payment regardless of size or quality. What we did do uh, was to look at this concern when it was raised last, uh, last summer and indeed made changes to ensure that there was greater support available to pharmacies in particular areas. Mr Peter Bone. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, one of David Cameron's greatest legacies was his efforts to fight human trafficking by the Modern Day Slavery Act. Last year, this country looked after 800,000 children in Syria or the surrounding countries, for the same investment of looking after 3,000 in this country. By doing that, we help defeat human trafficking. Could the Prime Minister confirm that we will continue with that policy? Well, I'm I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in paying tribute to David Cameron. I was very pleased that he supported uh, the Modern Slavery Act when I proposed that we should introduce it. Uh, And we are indeed committed to continuing our policy in relation to this area. I have set up a Modern Slavery Task Force at Number 10, which I chair, bringing together various parties to ensure that across government we are doing what is necessary, both to break the criminal gangs, to deal with the perpetrators, and to provide the necessary support for the victims. Mr Speaker, uh, may I, on behalf of my honourable and right honourable friends, join with the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in expressing condolences to the family of the late father of the House. He will be greatly missed. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Prime Minister, I am sure, cannot fail to have noticed the intervention by two former Prime Ministers recently in relation to the Brexit debate. Uh, and as a result, very helpful they were, I am sure. Um, I am sure the... Uh, I am sure the uh, Prime Minister will know, of course, what they and everybody else means by hard Brexit, what is meant by soft Brexit, but uh, we are all now wondering what is meant by a soft coup, and when indeed... uh, (laughs) And when indeed indeed it might be triggered, and when we will know if it has been triggered or not. (laughs) Perhaps the Prime Minister can elucidate on that as well, since it has been so helpful in other, so many other ways. Will she take the opportunity today, however, to make it clear that whatever former Prime Ministers may say, or whatever members of the unelected Upper House may say, the reality is that her plan to trigger Article 50 by the end of March is now clearly on track? Uh, I thank the right honourable gentleman for the question that he's asked. It is indeed my plan to trigger uh, by the end of March, and when I refer to that, I refer, of course, to the triggering of Article 50, rather than attempting to trigger any coup, soft or otherwise, that might take place. Uh, It is still our intention to do that. 
I think it is important. The Article 50 Bill, of course, does respond to the judgment of the Supreme Court, but it also ensures that we are responding to the voice of the United Kingdom when people voted to ensure that we do leave the European Union, and that is what we will do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, perhaps you, like many other honourable friends and members here today, took a shower this morning. You were very careful to check whether the shower gel contained microbeads. Products containing them can result in. Hear the (laughs) thrust of this fascinating question. Order! Mrs. Powell, let's hear it. Products containing um, shower gel products containing them can result in 100,000 microbeads or plastics being washed down the drain every time we use them into the water system and then into the marine environment, damaging these precious habitats. Would the Prime Minister join with me in welcoming the steps that this government is taking to introduce a ban on microbeads use in cosmetics and personal care products, with the consultation ending just a few days ago? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think I, I think I should. I think I. Uh, I think I should say, for clarity, uh, to members of this house, that I am not in a position to know whether or not you took a shower this morning. Mr. Speaker. Um, can I? In, in, uh, but in responding, my, my honourable friend, my honourable friend has raised a very important point, and it is completely unnecessary to add plastics to products like face washes and body scrub, where harmless alternatives can be used. As she re- referred to at the end of her question, our consultation to ban microbeads in cosmetics and personal care products closed recently. We're aiming to change legislation by October 2017, and we also asked for evidence of what more can be done in future to prevent other sources of plastic from entering the marine environment, because we are committed to being the first generation ever to leave the environment in a better state than it was inherited. And I'm sure that together we can all work to bring an end to these harmful plastics clogging up our oceans. I think both Philip and Sally are very reassured by what the Prime Minister has just said. Mrs Madeline Moon. Speaker, along the M4 corridor in South Wales, over a thousand families woke up this morning deeply worried about potential job losses at Ford in Bridgend. Families in Ogmore and in Bridgend are particularly frightened. (laughs) Frightened that Ford is not going to be able to bring new contracts into the factory with the uncertainty of Brexit ahead of them. Can I have an assurance from the Prime Minister that she will arrange for her ministers to meet with Ford and with Unite the Union to see what can be done to support Ford to ensure continuity of engine production in the Bridgend Ford plant? Can I reassure the Honourable Lady that our automotive sector is it's one of the most productive in the world. We want to see it going from strength to strength. That's why ministers in this government have been engaging with various companies within uh, the automotive secretary, sector, including Ford and other companies. Ford is an important investor here. It's been established here for over 100 years. We now account for around a third of Ford's global engine production, and Bridge End continues to be an important part of that. We have had, as I said, dialogue with Ford. We will continue to have a regular dialogue with Ford about the ways in which government can help to make sure that this success continues. Order! 